You know, we're continuing in our study through the book of Romans, and last week we emphasized the gifts of the Spirit uh, that, as Paul taught in prophecy, and today we're going to embellish on the verse that says, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. And as we sang in one of the worship songs, do not be overcome by evil, but to overcome evil with good. And to just do the lead in from Romans 12, 6 to 9 from last week, having then gifts, God gives gifts by the power of his Holy Spirit. And to, you know, we offer up our lives to Jesus as living sacrifices when we give our lives to him and he saves us. He sends the Holy Spirit and he wants to empower us and gift us and in different ways, gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us by him. He chooses how he wants to gift us to, use, to be used by him. Let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in a proportion to our faith or ministry. Let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teachings, he, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness, let love be without hypocrisy, abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. And we are going to spend some time on this because it's so important. Don't you think it would be important for us? We'd all agree we should abhor what's evil, right? We should just hate it. But we live in a time, and in fact, turn to Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. In our culture, we're seeing the very same thing that happened to Israel in the days of the kings. In the days of the kings, when God sent the prophet Eli Isaiah to warn the Jews, to warn the tribes of Israel that judgment was coming. And he lays out, you can read all of Isaiah, and it's just an incredible prophetic book of God mercifully, long-sufferingly warning the Jews to turn away from their sin and rebellion against God. And he lays out in the first couple chapters the signs of the nation of Israel ready for judgment. And one of those signs that the nation of Israel was ready for judgment is found in Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20. It says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. And so what's, what's happening when that happens is that uh, people, you know, God's word says what's good, and man becomes wise in their own imagination, and they say that's evil. Or what God's word says is evil, man in his own uh, conceit decides to say, no, that's good. You know, God says evil, we say good. God says good, we say evil. Are we living in a time like that today? And in fact, I, you know, we are talking last week in the prophetic update how the homosexual agenda is just like um, totally taken over the school system and that no other message is allowed. And I was talking to some people that go to the public school system. If they were to say anything contrary to, to, to proclaim the truth of what God says is evil in the Bible, they would get, their teachers would jump all over them. If they said it between students, the students would say, you can't say that, just stop it. You have to stop it. If they say it in the earshot of the teachers, it has to, it, it would be, you know, forcefully put down. And so, again, even the fact that we see in our society the silencing of proclaiming what God defines as good and evil is in our society today. And so, if we're going to get into the study as Christians, we want to abhor what is evil, we have to decide, well, what is evil? Who defines what evil is? Um, where do we go to get the facts? Of it? Well, if, if people will say, well, if there is no God, again, the teaching of evolution has its consequences. People, if evolution were true, if some chemicals decided to turn into life, even though it's a, it's a statistical impossibility, but let's say it happened, and then those chemicals that turned into life decided to become all the life forms on the earth, which is also an impossibility, but let's say it happened, then who decides what's good and evil? According to evolution, who decides... What's good and evil? The guy with the gun, he decides, because he's survival of the fittest. There is no other, if we're just an accident, there is no such thing as good and evil. 
There is only the, the survival of the fittest and whoever decides. And that might be a gang of people. That might be a, some people get together and say, hey, this is what we think is right. We think that slaughtering Jews is the right thing to do for the world. And we're going to do it. We don't care who they are, men, women, and children. We're going to put them on trains. We're going to stick them in an oven, and we're going to kill them. And, and then you just go off and you do that. In fact, evolution played a big part in Hitler's mindset of what needed to happen. So that, 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 that's what plays out. Mao Zedong, Pol Pot, all those guys, same thing. Evolutionary mindset, godlessness, there is no God. We've evolved. We can go kill and murder whoever we want to to establish our utopia, our government utopia. It's happened. Millions, hundreds of millions of people. People will say more people have been killed in the name of Christians, you know, Christianity and religion than anything else. No, the religion of atheism, that there is no God, has killed hundreds of millions of people. So... Well, if there is a God, which one do we pick? Do we pick the Muslim God? Do we pick the Hindu God? Gods, actually, millions of Hindu gods. Do we pick the Buddhist mindset? You know, where do we, no, for us, what do we want to say? The true God of the Bible is the one that decides what's good and evil. That's what we do. People hate us for that, but it's okay because we know it's true. Why do we know it's true? Again, as I've said a million times, the empty tomb. I tell people, how do you know? the empty tomb, the Jews, everything else. You're, you could go on and on and on, but the biggest thing, Jesus came. He came and he lived a perfect life, told us, went to the cross to die for our sins, and he rose three days later. We should listen to him. So let's go listen to Psalm 119, inspired by this Jesus. He is the word of God that he inspired into the minds of his prophets and apostles. And Psalm 119, 103, by the way, Psalm 119 is all about the law of God. It's all, the entire longest chapter in the Bible is all about the wonders of God's word. God's word being his precepts, his laws, which reveals his nature and his character. And so this is what the psalmist says about God's word. It says, how sweet are your words to my taste. Sweeter than honey to my mouth. Though through your precepts, through your laws, through what you declare to be good and evil, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate, put it into the Romans chapter 12, I abhor every false way. Turn to Psalm 119, 155. So that psalm is saying, you know, I love your word, God. I love the Bible. I love the truths of the Bible, and I hate everything contrary to your word, which is a lie, by the way. Everything that God says is true. Anything that's contrary to the truth of God's word is a lie, and we should abhor and hate the lie. Psalm 119, 155. Um, Salvation is far from the wicked. They do not seek, seek your statutes. So, yeah, there was the problem, taking the Ten Commandments down off the wall of the schools. There's getting the Bibles out of society, getting it so that the, the Bible declares that people say, I don't want to read the Bible. I don't want to think a thing about it. I don't want my children to be exposed to the Ten Commandments. I don't want my children to be exposed to any messages about Jesus or saying anything else. The Bible declares that their salvation is far from them because they don't even seek what God has to say. Tragic that so many go that way. And then Psalm 119, 162, and I mean, I, I could go on and on and on and on with Psalms and Proverbs and Old Testament, New Testament about the Word of God is what defines what's good and evil, but let's do one more. Psalm 119, 162. I rejoice at your word, as one who finds great treasure, I hate and abhor lying, but I love your lie. I love, I love your law. I hate and abhor lying, but I love your law. Again, everything contrary to God's word is a lie, and we love his commandments. And you know, so I, I think everybody should memorize the Ten Commandments. Uh, it might be a little bit harder for you than memorizing the scores of the playoff games and who plays and who's the guys, but it's going to have more spiritual value to you and to make sure that 
your children learn them. And yet this week's news, which is really troubling, and you can pray for the Pastor Stanley's family, Charles Stanley. How many of you ever heard Pastor Charles Stanley on TV? You know, million, you know hundreds of thousands of people sit down and have listened over the years. And, you know, he raised his, you know, he's, you know, the devil is, you know, he's had troubles in his family. His wife left him. And, you know, who knows what the story is about that. I don't know. But I, you know, one of the, one of the news items that's related to what I'm about to tell you uh, is at one time in his office, his son came in, Andy Stanley, who's also on TV. How many of you have seen Andy Stanley? Okay. You'll notice if you watched Andy Stanley, you realize his message is different than his dad's message. Have you noticed that? And it's very troubling. And one of the news items said that one time his son came in and Charles said to his son, he says, son, you have, you have gone to work for the enemy and you're my son. You know, that you're teaching a different gospel. You're teaching differently than what I've raised you. You're my son and you're actually teaching things that are contrary you know, to what I'm saying, you know, just that first quote is what it, you know, it must have been that was part of the conversation because he was, that was what was going on. But this week's news, January 10th, three days ago, um, popular megachurch pastor says Ten Commandments no longer apply to Christians. So Andy Stanley, this last week, has been saying, well, here, here let me quote exactly what this article says he said, and relate it to our study today. Because what we've learned already is that Psalms is saying God's word, his law, his, his precepts are what we love. Because as Christians, how do I know to abhor evil if I don't know what evil is? And I need God's law to tell me what evil is so that I can then say, I want to die to this. See, Jesus called us to crucify our flesh. Come at, if you, he wants to come after me, must pick up his cross and follow me. If you want to be my disciple, how many want to be his disciple? We all want to be his disciple. I don't know about you, but I need God's thou shalt nots in order to help me die to those things that my flesh wants to do still, because I'm still cursed with this flesh. If I want to do what God wants me to do, I have to know what he says. But this is what he says, this is what Andy Stanley said in this article by Paul uh, Boas, B-O-I-S, in the Daily Wire. Um, and again, popular megachurch pastor says Ten Commandments no longer apply. You can Google it, apply to Christians. If we're going to create a monument, because he says there should, you know, we sh as Christians should not be trying to get the monument of the Ten Commandments put up anywhere. I guess he would, he would say we shouldn't be trying to get it back in the schools. You know, it would be a good thing to put the Ten Commandments back up in the schools. It would be a very good thing. It would be healthy for our country to do that. But he, he would say, no, you shouldn't do that. If you want to create a monument to stand as a testament to our faith, shouldn't it at least be a monument of something that actually applies to us? End of quote. Then, Stanley openly pontificated, another quote, participants in the new covenant are not required, which is Christians, are not required to obey any of the commandments found in the first part of their Bibles. We're not... <laughs> And, you know, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt here and say, well, he, he's going to go on to say what that really means, but we're going to see the problem with that. But really, I don't have to, I can cut out the front part of my Bible. He's already said that there should, the church shouldn't be teaching the Old Testament. It's, that's then, this is now. He's already, there was big news about that many months ago. He's saying, you know, we don't have to do any of that Old Testament stuff. Uh, part, and then he goes on to say, quote, participants in the new covenant are expected to obey the single command Jesus issued as part of his new covenant. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. So throw out everything in the Bible that says thou shalt not, thou shalt, and just, just do this. Love one another. Does that work? Well, I mean, Jesus did say that, didn't he? Then you say all the laws wrapped up. In fact, Romans chapter 13 says, in, everything's wrapped up and you shall love the Lord your God and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So all the law is wrapped up in that, except that you can tell people, love God, love man, without explaining what that means. And they think, good, I don't have to worry about any of the Ten Commandments, I don't have to worry about anything else, just love God, love man, however I conceive loving to be. 
See, then we, then we go back to just don't be relying on your own imagination of what you think love is. It should, love is defined by the Bible. And for instance, when Jesus says, uh, he says, if you love me, what? <laughs> Obey my commandments, keep my commandments. So when we say love God, love man, God, Jesus defined that. If you really do love me, you'll obey my commandments. So in other words, I have to re, I have to pull my Old Testament out of the garbage can and put it back in my Bible, right? Because he's saying, if you love me, you're going to do what I say. Well, what are the commandments? Part of the Ten Commandments that deal with God, the first four commandments are all our relationship with God. No other gods before him. I'm going to believe in the God of the Bible and him only am I going to believe. I'm not going to listen to any other shenanigans by any other gods or any ecumenical movement that creates other gospel plans. I'm only going to believe in this God. That's what one of the commandments is. Jesus says, if you love me, you're going to do that. And you shall not use the Lord your God's name. You shall not... uh, Worship any idols. You shall not bow down to any idols. You shall not use the Lord's name, God, the Lord thy God's name in vain. You shall honor a Sabbath day. And then the other six are all relations with love man, which we're going to cover. So let's turn to um, Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. You know, <laughs> because here's New Testament. Here's Paul the Apostle who is reinstituting in the New Testament teaching of people like us, Christians. He was writing to the Christians in Galatia the same commandments that God had instilled at Mount Sinai with Moses. So, how, you know, it's not just a matter of cutting out your Old Testament. You have to cut it out of several teachings of Jesus in the New Testament. Jesus didn't just say, love God, love man. He said a bunch of other things, too, about marriage, divorce, everything else. And, you know, again, we're going to Galatians based on abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. And there's a little analogy that I have in my mind. You know, here's what I, when I think abhor, think of, you can do whatever you want to. But see, the world is coming to us, and we're going to look at these different aspects of the flesh that God says to avoid that we're going to see in Galatians. And we're supposed to abhor every single one of these. Well, what's abhor? What's a good abhor? <laughs> Mine is, it goes to Sudan. In Sudan, teaching the chaplains in Sudan, you know, they eat where they eat, you eat where, you know, we eat where we eat. We eat with plates and forks and spoons that are cleaned and everything else. They eat, they get their their food, and you watch them, and you can be around them, and they do it the Sudanese way, which out in the bush and everything else, their world country, they didn't have forks and knives and everything. They They can't go to Costco and buy, you know, big batch of toilet paper, they don't have hand cleaner. They don't have soap. They, they have to live out there in the bush, and, and they, they do what they do, and they grab their bowl, and they have beans and rice, and they just go like this. They just mix it up with their fingers. And then they have really, an, you know, they have a very interesting way of that, that those fingers become a perfect spoon, and they just can go like this and just slop it right in their mouth. Now, they've never done this, but had they ever said, you know, Kevin, here's, here, come here. Let me put it in you. To me, that would be abhorring. <laughs> I, I would be seeing, you know, even though my eyes are not seeing them, I'm seeing millions of little parasites and bacteria and viruses and scum, and I'm thinking in my mind, they just went to the bathroom. I know they probably don't clean. I'm just going to get a little poop along with it, and I'm going to get... You know, just everything, I would just like, I would upchuck and say, no, thank you. Now, you can come up with your own way of thinking about it, but that's what abhor is. Abhor is God saying, hate it, so it's not even, it's not even a temptation that you would see the flesh for what it is. Because the flesh is wicked, isn't it? And the flesh puts a happy face on things to make... It seemed like it's good, but it's not. So, Galatians, Paul writing, talking to us, warning the church, New Testament church, to flee from the things of the flesh. And he says, these are the things of the flesh, which are adultery. We're supposed to abhor adultery. Um, Well, it's prevalent in our society, wouldn't you say? 
In fact, Jesus, he said, when he comes back to earth, will he find faithfulness? Will he find faith on the earth? Faith, faithfulness, really, goes hand in hand. And I think he's talking about towards him. But will he even find faithfulness in man to man? Faithfulness in our relationships. And, you know, one of the things that what we should do in abhorring, because it's in our face and everything, there's hardly any movie, any TV show, and whatever that doesn't have sexual immorality and in innuendos or, or teaching. And what we should be seeing is obnoxiousness. Our mind should be going, oh, how terrible they're pursuing adultery. How, uh, how terrible that they're pursuing immorality. How terrible that these things are happening. And not let your mind ever see it for how it's trying to be portrayed as something that's good. It's something that will bring wholesomeness. It's something that's going to spruce up your life, et cetera, et cetera. We should see it for what it is. And see, the devil is going to sit there and go, well, why not have an adulterous affair with somebody or with someone? And, you know, the answer is I abhor it because I know God's Word says, oh, Ten Commandments, thou shalt not commit adultery, reinforced by Paul in the New Testament. Now, many people are affected by adultery. Maybe some of you here have been affected as, as being a victim of it or a perpetrator of it. Here's the cool thing about all of this teaching, is it takes the Holy Spirit to make it real in our life, and it takes confessing to God, because it says in 1 John, if you confess your sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins, and what? Cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So we have to agree with God, God, I should have abhorred that. I'm, I really grieve that I leaned on my own understanding, and I want to trust you in forgiveness, and I want to flee from it for the rest of my life. See, that's, that's a solution. This is not a condemnation list or a condemnation study. It's just that we have to agree with God. What God's Word is saying that we agree with Him. So, um, and what... What barriers have we put? If you're single here today, this is pointed out in our men's retreat yesterday. If you're single here today, how do you put a barrier against adultery? Well, I can't commit adultery. I'm not married. Yes, you can, because your spouse is out there somewhere. Your spouse is there, and you can commit adultery by putting your eyes, letting things come into your eyes, or letting actual physical relationships occur before you're married to your spouse. And see, God's law about this is for our good. And as they pointed out, as one of the pastors pointed out, to violate this is it can damage your future relationships with your spouse-to-be. And, and God wants to do what's good for us. So any singles growing up into today, yeah, I read the statistics of what's happening in high school. You are an absolute fool if you haven't uh, lost your virginity by the time you're graduating from high school today. And if there's anybody here that is still a virgin, do you realize, don't listen to the world. Don't listen to that pressure. Be truthful to God. Be abhorring evil. And stay, stay pure for that husband, that wife that God has for you in the future. And you will not regret it. Let the fools be the fools. And the fools are the ones that think that God's word uh, should not, is archaic and should be thrown into the ash heap. And God will bless you. So, and if you're married, put up, put up all kinds of walls today. You know, so many marriages have been destroyed through all the social media, getting back with flings of the past and Facebook and social media and everything else. And I, I personally, when I saw all that happening, I put up roadblocks. No, no Facebook, no this, no that, no everything. Because, because just put up hedges and barriers to keep it from messing with, uh, you know, my faithfulness to Juanita. You know, it, it, you can live for, so far we're 43 years faithful. How tragic it would be to throw that away at any time, right? And see, once you throw it away, you never get it back. And so you need to stay, you need to abhor evil, cling to that which is good. Uh, this, year, this week's news is Bezos, the richest man in the world, is going to divorce his wife, or she's divorcing him because he, why? You know, part of the news is he traded some naked pictures of his buff body with his girlfriend, and who knows if she did with him, and, and so they're the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, 
the pride of life. She'll appreciate me more, so I'm going to dump my wife at 25 years so I can go off into this other relationship and we can split our billions of dollars together. I mean, it's going to be, and see, here's the thing. We can grieve for them, right? Because he's godless. Because he's, he's wicked in the sense that he does not care squat about what God says. But we know from God's word, whether you believe him or not, his word comes true, and he will have regrets in his life. There will be consequences for that. That's going to be into his family, their four children. It's going to be into him in those quiet times when he's thinking, wow, maybe the grass wasn't so greener was all, as always happened. All these things are going to happen in life, and we can grieve and pray that someday maybe he would come uh, to believe in Jesus. But see, there again, the technologies and stuff that are just stirring up people with, with no rudder. They don't have the guidance of God's word. They don't have a way of knowing. And they take these hard left rudders, hard right rudders, and then they crash into the coral, the reefs that are just below their boat, and they die. But we, if we abhor these things, then it's not going to affect us. And fornication which the word, the Greek word there is pornea. Guess what that, <laughs> guess how that's used in our society. Oh, Lord Jesus, help us. Which, re- it, it equates with adultery. It goes along with adultery. It means all forms of sexual immorality. Sex outside of marriage. Same sex. You know, every kind of immorality that there is. Exploding in our culture because of I attribute it to the invention of film. The invention of film exploded this in our culture. And then, and then it was turned into a nuclear bomb when it became, when it became digital. And the invention of digital photography turned it into a nuclear bomb. And as people are becoming more and more aware of the fact that what they they take and post and text each other and stuff is picked up by the NSA. I I would hate to be an NSA person today. You'd just be exposed to just checking through people's texts and everything that they collect. You'd have to be, you'd you'd be into porn just to be doing your job. And so now the big craze is they bring, they brought back digital Polaroid cameras that they're just a one-shot deal and they print out the, print out the, the film. So now it can be you know, it's just going to be just private. And why would people do that unless there's some nefarious wickedness behind it, actually? Um, may God help us to, uh, to flee from fornication, to flee from porn. It is the biggest curse in our culture today. And I don't mean America's culture. I mean the world. Multi-billions of dollars destroying people's lives by the billions around the world, sucking in and depriving people of billions of dollars of money that have been spent, uh, supporting a sex slave of innocent men, women, and children of sexes, both sexes, being marketed, stolen, kidnapped, marketed in the dingy places around the world for the satisfaction of men's flesh, which they should be abhorring doing so in accordance with God's word, which has been rejected and has created all this havoc. And look at it that way. For those that might have been ensnared by pornography, look at it for all the abhorring results and consequences of what it's done to people's lives. And maybe God will set you free. It takes the power of the Holy Spirit to make it happen. Uh, So then it says uncleanness, you know, flee, you know, abhor fornication, flee from fornication, flee from uncleanness, physical or moral impurity. We should abhor having filthy body, mind, and house. Uh, it, it applies to the living conditions. Did you know in the 1300s, the Black Plague struck Europe? You ever hear about that? Black Plague? Black Plague was because of fleas taking a disease that would go from flea to man, but they got it from rats. The, the rats were the carrier of the disease, and then the fleas would bite them, bite people, then they'd get the plague and they'd die. You know, uh, ring around the rosy, pocket full of posy, 
ashes, ashes, we all fall down. That was a nursery rhyme that goes back to the Black Plague because people get a rosy around their arm and then they'd all fall down, ashes, ashes, burning all the bodies. And they, in the 1300s, half of Europe died. 50 million people died. Can you imagine a plague hitting America where 50 million people died? And you know who was least affected? In fact, almost not affected at all were Jewish populations because the Jews would stay to themselves. They wouldn't live with the others. And they would just live in their communities. And then Europeans, the other Europeans noticed, you know, those Jews, they're not dying like us. And you know what they thought? You know what Satan told them? Satan told them, those Jews are sneaking around and putting something in our water to make us all die. So they started rounding up, burning, killing Jews by the thousands, and then taking all of their stuff because they thought the Jews had done it. But you know what had caused the Jews to be protected? Uh, here's what Wikipedia says. There are many possible reasons why Jews were accused to be the cause of the plague. One reason are the many Jewish laws that promote cleanliness. A Jew must wash his or her hands before eating bread and after using the bathroom. It was customary for Jews to bathe once a week. <laughs> wow, they bathed a lot once a week. <laughs> uh, once a week uh, before the Sabbath. A corpse must be washed before burial, and so on. And, and, you know, that's all Wikipedia says. God gave them laws. Hey, when you go to the bathroom, you better take your spade with you, and you better dig first, and you better stick the stuff in the hole and cover it up because the Lord your God walks through your camp, and he doesn't want to stick in your stuff. That's what basically a paraphrase of what the law says. And all kinds of other things. In other words, they buried their garbage. They buried everything. So guess what? There's not as many rats. And so the rats aren't there to carry the fleas, to contaminate the Jews with the disease. And so by the wisdom of God, that he knows, because God knows everything. See, they, they bury their stuff. And down in San Francisco, Portland, all these other cities, people have to walk carefully where they go now throughout the city because there's human waste everywhere because of the homelessness issues that are going on. We're going to have... So, all that to say, God's... You know, people say, the Bible says cleanliness is next to godliness. Actually, it doesn't say that. There's nowhere in the Bible that says that. But the Bible's law does say, you know, we should be clean. And it's good for us, right? Dead and sick people can't witness Jesus, get about Jesus. Jesus wants us to stay alive. So we should be, we should be clean. I know some first, res, you know, some, uh, you know, firemen type of first responders, people that have to go into people's houses when 911, and, uh, you know, more than one have told me they go into places that they, they almost feel like they need to get into full garb and, and masks just to walk into. It is so filthy they can't even believe anybody could possibly live there. Cats, dogs, everywhere, rot, rotted stuff, rotted food, feces, everywhere. Tra you can't, the only trail is to the bathroom and to the kitchen, and there's dishes and stuff all piled over. And I, you know, Kevin, really, I mean, we came to church for this today. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's this, and, and I'm going to say... Satan, I think, inspires people to live that way. How could somebody want to live that way? Because it's so deadly. It's so inconvenient. And, and so Satan can inspire us just like he can inspire people into adultery, into fornication, into everything else. He can inspire people into hoard, what we call hoarding or other things that create an unhealthy environment, and I think God's people, God's word says God's people should stay free from that. We should be living in cleanliness, you know? And I, I thank Jesus for my wife, kind of, because she really makes me have to be clean. <laughs> I mean, it's like, put your dish away or clean it. I mean, it's like, and you're not going to leave your stuff here. There's a place for everything, and it's just like, and, you know, so 
She was raised that way. She's helped raise me that way. And, and I'm, very, I'm very, very thankful for it, actually. And uh, so, lewdness. The next one, lewdness. No self-control pertaining to vices or sexual perversion. You know, the, 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 it's against the law to be lewd and licentious in public where people expose themselves. That's what it's talking about. Without self-control. I've talked, I've talked to people that have come into the church that their background was that they would, they would unclothe in public. Uh, how, how demonic is that? It, it's just like, how crazy. See, again, all of this, we're in a spiritual battle. Jesus says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, spiritual weakness, and high places. And we've got to, we've got to get the Word of God into us to be our shield of faith and our head, uh, sh- our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel and have the Word of God to set us free from these things. God is saying God's people should have nothing to do with this kind of stuff. Again, trading pictures and everything else that can happen with technology. Idolatry, sorcery, drug use. Sorcery, drug use. Often associated with witchcraft. We legalize marijuana. In fact, I just heard that uh, uh, one of the colleges is offering the course of the medical benefits of marijuana. And yeah, there's pain effects, but they're, they're doing studies. And it is a fact by not Christian, you know, tweaking, but by medical people that marijuana dumbs you down. And not just you, it dumbs your children. It affects your DNA to make your offspring way less capable of dealing with problems in life. They, according to rats and mice, that a offspring of a dope-smoking rat or mouse is stupider than a, than a sober rat or mouse by significant amount because it, they push this pedal and the food comes out. And so what they do is they, take, they switch it over to the other side, the other pedal, and they, and they keep on hitting that. Why is the food not coming? They keep trying and trying and trying and trying. And it took the offspring of the dopers 150 tries where the offspring of the sober was 50 tries. So don't listen to a college professor that just got a job teaching the wonderful virtues of marijuana. Uh, the medical studies are showing it's destructive. And I was, you know, uh, in my foolish, unbelieving days of a, of a teenager, in the early days of marijuana, I knew it was making me stupid. I knew it was making me lazy. I knew it was changing totally the way I thought about just work ethic. Working, in, I was busboy, dishwasher, everything else, working hard. And, when I st- and then start smoking marijuana, and all of a sudden, I just didn't really care as much anymore. It affected me, so I'm one of your rat cases. <laughs> I did, devoted my body to human science so that I could skip the rat phase of being stupid. But... Lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred. A lot of Christians are saying, hey, it's legal. It's just like taking anything else. Why not smoke a little marijuana? Because it's evil. Because it's wicked. Because you're taking it to just get your mind high. It's not to take it to kill. You know, and again, if there's some pain thing that just takes the high part out of it and gives it the pain, well, then okay. You know, like opium. Or, you know, you, you need pain pills. You can take something like that. But if you're doing something to get high, you're serving the devil and your flesh of lust. You are not serving God. Don't be deceived. Contentions. I had a guy in one. <laughs> Contentions, always looking for a way to be upset, to cause a fight. Oh, you know, dad's coming home. I wonder if he's going to go off the handle Contentions. You know, I'm going to come home. Mom's going to be upset about this. Contentions. You know, I've seen Sibs sit around. They just, instead of just, hey, you know, it's good to see you again. I'm glad you're my sister, my brother, whatever. Just, just contentions. See, the devil wants to get us contentious with each other, to never enjoy and appreciate the love of, the love that God wants us to have with one another. I had a guy stand up in my office once. He was an elder of the church. And, you know, he got offended by something that, 
know, I could have said a little bit different. It was still kind of minor. It was like, make a decision with how I'm going to call your wife. Um, and, uh, and he stood up and he says, I will destroy you. And by the way, that's not a work of the Spirit. Um, that's, a, that's a contention. And it didn't, it didn't just stop there. It wasn't like the next day, man, I can't believe I fleshed out and said I will destroy you. It went on to, yes, I will do everything in my power, lie, cheating, stealing, whatever it takes to destroy you. Um, we have to be careful to realize who, you know, like, like our study tonight in the evening service with Carl Kirby, who are we listening to? See, we can be thinking we're so self-righteous. Somebody did me wrong. I'm going to do them wrong. I'll destroy them. Uh, no. Jesus gets into that. Jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, heresies, murders, drunkenness, getting back at people. It's all this stuff is supposed to go away. We can't deceive ourselves into thinking things of the flesh are from God. Jealousies create bitterness, lack of thankfulness, outbursts of wrath, throwing things. By the way, if you have holes in your wall at home and dishes that are broken on the floor, then you're guilty of outbursts of wrath. And again, uh, the Holy Spirit needs to, we need to sit there and agree with God. Nope, I needed to do that because if I didn't hit the wall and punch a hole in the wall, then I would have hit somebody and so, God, I'm doing pretty spiritual today. No. It's, I've got to realize that I'm sinning against God. And, and again, this is no condemnation, right? We're just trying to let God's word teach our hearts. I want to be different. I want God, I want, I want to change from being a worldly person, worldly fleshly person. I want to be turned into a child of God who listens to him and can be a witness to others. No outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, walking over people to get to the top, dissensions, heresies, spreading division, you know, like saying that the Ten Commandments are no longer part of the church. is a type of spiritual heresy that's coming into the church. And people are going to be talking about this, dividing, creating all kinds of chaos, when the church should just be sitting there. All the church should be saying, no, we love the law of God. It's probably sweeter than the honey and the honeycomb, but it's wrapped into the grace of Jesus. It shows us who God is, and by the grace of Jesus, we can be forgiven, but we agree with God's law. And we should all be saying that to this world. But now we've got two different messages out there. And they go, you Christians can't even figure out whether or not the Old Testament stays or not. You guys are all crazy. I don't want to believe in your Jesus. Heresies. Envy in verse 21, which breeds coveting, adultery, murders. I had a guy come into my office here a couple weeks ago from India. Smart guy. He was telling me something I hadn't even ever heard before. You know how many abortions there's been in India, according to him? And I looked it up to say, yeah, it looks like it's even more than that. 400 million. And he said it's gotten so bad in India that, because it's mostly girls, just like in China, mostly girls, and so there's, the guys want a wife. And so certain states within India are, have put together these, you know, it's kind of like a mafia. It's like a kidnap a girl mafia squad that goes into other states and just finds and kidnaps girls 8 to 12 to set up the arranged marriages that are within the Indian culture. So, you know, you need a girl, you need a wife, we got a wife that they kidnap from some other place because they've killed 400 million you know how many Russians have been killed through abortion? According to statistics that you can Google, how many abortions in Russia, and you go through the entire list of all the years, and it exploded in the 70s, just like here. 70s exploded. Here, there, India, same thing. That's when it all started, is when the world said, let's kill them, it's just a piece of flesh. 200 million. You know how many people live in Russia today? 150 million. They, they killed 200 million Russians before they were born, and they only have 150 million now. And we think we're bad at 60 million, which we are. And see, we, and here's, here's Christians, again, applying Galatians, Romans, <laughs> abhorring what is evil. Should we, could we ever vote for politicians, representatives who say that I'm going to go support the Democratic platform which says abortion on demand anytime, anyplace. Can we do that? Not if we abhor it, 
If, if we see, the, you know, here's the Democratic Convention, you know, here, let me scoop this up, and in the eyes of God, we're going to say murder children. Do you want some? No. Drunkenness, a growing curse in America. You know, people think that these legalizing it, making it easy, why not, you know? More taxes. We'll get more taxes from the marijuana. Let's vote for it. <laughs> we, we, that, that's going brain dead on the spiritual aspects of the destruction that comes because it's a spiritual thing that destroys us. Revelries, out of control parting. And then it goes, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, Paul, I tell you, under inspiration of God, tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. If we practice it. See, again, a true believer can fall into any number of these. Christian true believers fall into adultery. True Christians fall into sexual immorality. True Christians can fall into stealing and other things. But you know what happens to a true Christian when they do? They go, oh, what a fool I played, God. Forgive me. I thank you for your forgiveness through Jesus Christ. But I agree with you. I don't agree with your law. And I don't want to live in it. And even if I fall again, God, I want to agree with you. It's evil and wicked. And see, Jesus says, just like he told us 70 times 7, for somebody that comes and repents and says, God, I, I know I shouldn't. I want to turn away. 70 times 7, he'll be merciful to us, but we miss out on walking a holy life with him every time that we're letting our lives be churned up by the things of the world and the flesh of the world. And we can say no. See, God has made it so that a true believer can say no. Going back to Romans 12, 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. By the way, stay in Galatians because we're going to do the good part of Galatians here. I'm sorry. Um, we got to do the good news. Um, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil is what we covered. And can we... All say, amen, we don't want to do any of those things. Amen? All those things should be set free in our life. Don't, don't, make it, don't let the devil make excuses in your mind, because that's what the devil's good at trying to do. Um, but cling to what is good. What is good? Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that comes into us if we let him reign, if we let his power take over our lives, what it will bring is love. And that love of God will cause us to abhor the things that we just covered. And that love brings into my life joy and peace. You know, there's a difference between, ha it doesn't say happiness, did you notice? You know what happiness, happiness is? Here's my way of defining it and keeping the difference between joy and happiness. Happiness is an emotion that we feel much like joy, but it's, it's based on, contingent on, our experience, our, our environment. I can be happy that something good just happened, but joy does not depend upon your circumstances. Joy is something that you can have, as Paul did, in chains standing before the Romans who are threatening to kill him, he had joy because he was living in service to Jesus. And he had something that the Romans couldn't take away, a joy, my life belongs to Jesus. And I'm here praying and sharing the Jesus with you. And if you embrace it, I wish that all of you were as I am except for these chains. You have joy despite your circumstances if you're walking in the Spirit. Peace, even in suffering, long-suffering, not just patient, but patient in suffering is what long-suffering is. Kindness, to friend and foe alike. You know, this is something the Lord's been convicting me of because it's so easy we walk through life and somebody's too slow in the checkout lane and whatever, and you can just all of a sudden get upset. And That's one of my weaknesses. And you know what? And see, God has cursed me because no matter which lane, you go in Costco and you go, that one's going to be the fastest. And I get in that lane, and it just never fails. Something's wrong. It's like I even play a game like I would pick that one, so now I'm going to pick that one because if I pick that one, that would be the slower. <laughs> so that one is what I'm going to go. And the Lord's been working on me to just, to just and with the help of Juanita, by the way, you're being a bad witness. <laughs> 
uh, yes, you're right, God, I'm sorry, <laughs> forgive me, to just to try for us to be kind to people because that's not what people are into today. You'll, you'll be a great witness to be kind to people, to just even smile at them when you're walking through the grocery store because you care for their soul. You actually, kind of, God, help me to look at them like you. And I, he's actually answered that prayer. And so people I don't even know, I'll make eye contact and smile at them with the love and joy of Jesus to be kind to them. And, to, and God, that that would be 100% of my life, that there's never an exception is my goal. Pray for me to that end because I want that to be the case. Kindness. Goodness. To be known to be, you know, that's a good man, that's a good woman. If you fear God, shun evil, abhor what is evil, that's what they'll say, except for, you know, when you're being good about serving Jesus and they want to be evil. Faithfulness to Jesus, to your spouse, gentleness, as opposed to outbursts of wrath. Guys, could we all just say, I want to be a gentleman when I walk in the door? And I want to even pray that before I walk in the door, Lord, don't let Satan just mess me up by some discouragement when I walk in the door. I've, I've sensed Satan just seriously getting me to just stir me up when all I would have had to do is go, no, I'm not going to be. I'm not going to let him stir me up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go in and just be resting in him, resting no matter what's going on, gentleness, self-control. My flesh wants to indulge but I no longer am a slave to sin, so I can say no. Self-control. I can say no because God is in charge of my life. Against such, there is no law. So far, nobody's making a law against, hey, you have too much self-control, you got to do 60 days in jail. <laughs> so far. <laughs> you know, but as we call evil good and good evil, who knows how bad it's going to get. You know, just, and in Paul's day, oh, you're preaching Jesus, that is. Now there's a law against that, you got to die. Well, okay, so, but these character traits, nobody makes a law against gentleness, self-control, long-suffering, patience, joy, kindness. And those who are Christ's have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, if we live in the Spirit, if Jesus is truly inside of us and has given us everlasting life, then let us also walk in the Spirit. See, we are alive as true believers. How we walk is dependent upon how much we want to serve the flesh and how much we want to serve Jesus. And if we want to live in the Spirit and serve Jesus, then we want to walk in the Spirit let us walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another, which is divisiveness. So now we go back to Romans 12, 9, and once again conclude the study by saying we did one verse in Romans. <laughs> but we did cover other verses, and I hope that this verse will mean something. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Can we do that? And I, and I actually just pray as, you're, as if the Lord was using me in your life, which is my, was my prayer before this, that I would be a conduit of his truth, then, then my prayer is that, see, we're all different. We all have our weaknesses of the flesh. We have all of our struggles that are different. But as we went through this, my prayer before the study was, that the Holy Spirit would convict, not condemn, but just convict everybody heart here who is a true believer with, you know, it's time to work on this. I do want you to die and crucify yourself to this and this and this, or this, <laughs> or whatever it is. And it, it, God has spoken to me. His Holy Spirit has spoken to me in some of this. And that's what we're doing as Christians. We're in love with God. He's in love with us. See, he loves us perfectly. What he's called us to do is love him. We did that the day we bowed the knee to him. But it's an imperfect love, isn't it? The day that we bowed the knee, we're still all messed up. And what we want to do is as we grow in our love for him, God, I want to love you more, I want to love you more. And he says, what does he say? Just like Jesus says, well, then do what I've said. Turn away from the flesh. Turn towards the things of God. 
even in this corrupted world that we're in. And we'll see some other, you know, if you come to the evening service tonight, Carl Kirby, actually Carl Kirby's son gives a great inspirational, uh, he wasn't there, but his dad was talking about his son, grew up in the church and said, Dad, you know what? I just realized God wants to cut this thing out of my life. And it, would, it was a, a neat conviction. Nice to see uh, convictions that just help us to walk in the Spirit. Amen? So, let's stand and pray. Father, we, I, I, I just am so thankful, Lord, for your precepts, your thou shalt nots, your exhortations, because God, I, without them, I would, I would not be able to know your character, Lord, the things that you hate, the things that you hate that actually you hate because they bring such destruction to your creation and come from the devil and his deceptions in our fallen ways as man who rebelled against you in the garden. And God, I, I pray for all of us here that love you and know you, that you would help us to hate these things of the flesh as much as you do. Help us, God, to draw closer to you. Help us, God, to just realize that the benefits of doing so is more and more of the fruits of the Spirit, the love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control, that would that bring such inner peace and joy and usefulness to you, God. And we pray that you would help us to be that shining light of a witness for you by the power of your Spirit working in us and help us to die to ourselves, to crucify, to cut up and hack out those things that are at enmity with you, that are destroying our witnesses, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God of all creation, you bring life to all who seek your face, yeah, so we lift our hands, our hearts and sweet surrender, and we cry out. your name.